Hey everyone, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 22. What did you do? Wolf Dolan. Wolf Dolan, there you go. Yeah, the big man. So obviously we've got a guest on the show today, Mr. Dan Rusinowski. Great to be a guest on this show. I mean, I've been waiting all day locked up in a garage <laughs> with, with absolutely no food or water, but I'm, I think I'm gonna make it. That's only a small fib. That's almost true, completely. <laughs> So we've got a really good show for you. We're going to be talking about uh, what's going on in the season so far. Uh, obviously getting Dan's take on that and talking about some of the guys that are ready to break out and kind of blossom into a bigger role. Yeah, we're going to talk about Eric Carlson. Yep. I feel like we talk about him every week, but of course we do. We'll talk about it. We'll update with him. <laughs> uh, we're going to have a name game as well for, for Dan. See, uh, I've always said that this is the man that I look to for uh, how to pronounce a name properly. So we're going to put him to the test. Oh boy. Yep. <laughs> And I think that would be, that's pretty much it. So are yeah. you ready to start the show? I'm ready. Okay, and if you're watching on YouTube, uh, this is not a gerbil stable to my lip. <laughs> this is Movember, folks. <laughs> okay, so uh, really quick, just wanted to go over a couple of things. One, um, the, the mustache, obviously, uh, month of November, Movember, mustache only. So that's why I'm looking as ridiculous as I look. <laughs> if you're listening as a podcast, you are lucky. Uh, in any case, um, please feel free to jump on to the Movember. There's a Mo space, I believe is what it's called. We'll yeah, we'll put below. the link down there in the description down below. Again, if we put it on the screen, you click it, it's just going to pause the video. So uh, <laughs> please click on the description down below. Uh, also, we have the Google Home that we're giving away. And again, we'll put that link down in the description down below. Mm -hmm. But uh, enough of that. I want to get to uh, the main meat of the show here. Our guest, Dan Rusinowski, Eagle Scout. Dan yes. Indeed. Yeah, it's that's impressive. And, I, and a proud member of the, uh, the board at uh, the Silicon Valley Boys... Uh, Boy Scouts of America nice. Council. So really happy about that. Silicon Valley and Monterey Bay Council. Wow, cool. Very nice. cool. What, nice. is, uh, what did you do for your Eagle Scout project? It was way interesting. I, way, way back. I, I was, it was actually really late. I ended doing a, a landscaping project for the city of Milford, Connecticut, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I directed a group of people and we, uh, we redid a whole bunch of landscaping around a tennis court area in a park. Mm -hmm. And it was there for about 25 years. <laughs> wow. So finally they ripped it all apart and now <laughs> it's gone. So there's no, there's no evidence that I ever did it. It's great value though for them. <laughs> yeah, it was good. 25 years, wow. Cool. So we've got uh, the book. Aaron purchased the book. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if These Walls Could Talk, uh, uh, Ross McEwen. Ross McEwen. McEwen, sorry. See, last names. There you go. <laughs> I got the right guy. I know I did. A lot so, of people say Ross McKeon, and okay. he almost kind of half accepts it. Reminds me of the old story. Uh, you remember the goaltender Tom Barrasso yes. played yeah. for the U.S. Olympic yeah. team? Yeah. So I wanted to know, walked up to him one day and I said, do you pronounce your last name Barrasso or Barrasso? And he said, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. So Ross McKeon or McEwen, but when you call his house, he says, thanks for calling the McEwen residence. So oh, okay. That's how I say it. There you go. So co-authored uh, with by Ross and, and Dan. And he's a great writer. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, you uh, actually great. bought it. You read yeah. the majority of it. He hasn't gotten through the whole thing yet, but I think I'm missing two chapters. Out yeah. Of it, but the end. But yeah. So go, go right ahead. You wanted to ask him a couple of things. Well, or? how did you guys start getting into writing the book? Well, it, it was a really interesting process, and and for those who don't know, this uh, this series, if if these walls could talk, it's not only the San Jose Sharks. Okay. Uh, Ken Daniels, who does the play-by-play -play on TV for the Detroit Red Wings, mm -hmm. did uh, the version of the Red Wings, and uh, oh. each each team kind of constructs it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. But the whole purpose of it is it is to get behind the scenes, so to speak, and to maybe tell a few stories that that, that fans don't know, mm -hmm. haven't heard before, or would like to hear again and uh, maybe get a different perspective on it after a number of years later. And it, they're all involving broadcasters, people who do play-by-play -play for the team. So I was pretty honored to be asked by Triumph Books, who publishes the series, mm -hmm. and Ross McEwen, who did a series for them. You may remember the book, 100 Things That the Sharks Fans Should Do Before They Die. Yeah. <laughs> I, I gave him a little uh, help on that one, too. We worked uh, on a couple of small parts of it, mm -hmm. and we worked really well together, and we always have gotten along well. So um, it, it was seemed to be really easy to put this together. and. I'll tell you what, it involved a lot of work. We, yeah. we spent a lot of time over the summer um, going through some old stories, editing them down, and then when we got the final edit piece, it looked like they were ready to go to print, and I noticed a bunch of things that we needed to change. So oh. uh, we, that always happens whenever you're writing something. And it's not that different than to what I do on the air, because each day I'm telling a story.
story. So yeah. in a sense, uh, it's, a, it's a story that I, I'm used to telling, but the difference is I, I don't have an immediate deadline. I had a deadline of a couple of months, which <laughs> made it a lot nicer. Yeah, nice. No, it's really good, and I would highly recommend it. You haven't read it yet, so yeah, no, I, I haven't. I was actually thinking about getting it as an audio book, but then I can't have Dan sign my audio book. It's not possible. <laughs> I'll sign that so, one for you. No oh, I'm gonna have to get another one and meet up with you at a, at a later date. Maybe we'll sure. see you at a practice. I'm sure. So <laughs> no problem. Uh, was there any? Uh, there was one excerpt that Aaron had shared about uh, Archer's Herbe, uh, who I'm probably saying the name wrong, but um, <laughs> um, he had said that he was pretending not to know English. Something to that effect? Did, would you mind going just a little no, bit? No, not into, at all. Yeah. Um, it, it's one of the uh, great stories from the early years. And it, it basically, when Arthur Zerbe came here uh, to the United States, he had just been through something really traumatic and intense. And that was uh, the separation and the end of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. the fact that his country, Latvia, had been so oppressed for so long. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> he was right there on the barricades with all the people that were protesting and trying to break away from the Soviet Union. And so he was intimately involved in the political situation there. And uh, he came here and he had some very halting English things to say about it. Um, he was very measured in his speech. But he did speak a little bit of English, and so he was reassigned to the Kansas City Blades at the time, <laughs> and that's where Kevin Constantine was the head coach. And at that time, uh, they were the first place team in the IHL, far and away, wow. number one. I think they won 52 games that first wow. year, <laughs> while the Sharks won 17 yeah. <laughs> out of 80 out of 80 that year. Yeah. So uh, he gets recalled. And he had been going through some of these drills with Coach Kevin Constantine. You may remember, he was a very particular guy, very structured as to what he wanted his team to do. And, uh, you know, we'll get into it later with what he did with Larionov and Makarov. He basically mm -hmm. took all the guys that drove him crazy and put them all together and said, you guys do what you need to do. Everybody else is going to play it my <laughs> way. And then they went to, you know, game seven or round two because of it. Uh, so the, the creativity was there. But Archer's was part of that creative group, uh -huh. um, you know, involved politically and so forth. And so uh, he kept telling Kevin he didn't understand the English <laughs> the, about the drill. He would say, I want you to be in this position when this situation occurs, and I want you to do the drill this way. And he would say, no English, no English. <laughs> so uh, the, he let him go, get away with it. Then he gets recalled. And I think it might have been Ross McEwen who asked him the question. Um, I, I don't know if that's really true, but we, we can tell it that way. <laughs> um, Ross or somebody in the media group said, what's better? Uh, to be with the first place team in the International League or a last place team in the NHL. Mm. And Arthur Zerbe, who didn't understand enough English to understand what the coach was talking about in Kansas City, said, <laughs> it's better to be a pauper in a rich man's house. <laughs> and Kevin, of course, at that time, there's no internet, right? Yeah. They were getting all of the newspaper articles faxed to them. Mm -hmm. So the fax comes in and Kevin reads it and he reads this. And he said, we're going to have to have a little chat about how much English he doesn't know when he gets back here. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Yeah, oh, that's my a good goodness. one. So stories just like that uh, inside of the, ball, uh, the book yes. here, If These Balls Could Talk. Uh, please go have a, a look at it. Check it out. Uh, if you can get a physical copy and then maybe you get a chance to meet Dan and sign it for you. Otherwise, that Happy audio copy, uh, he'll he'll sign your CD player. Maybe. And by the <laughs> way, there are going to be some opportunities. We've already had one great signing at Books, Inc. in yeah. Mountain View a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they sold every copy that the bookstore ordered. Nice. The place was great. packed. We had a nice little uh, talk with the group, and it was a lot of fun. Both yeah. Ross and I were yeah. there. We had another event also at a Meet the Sharks event at SAP Center for season ticket holders. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had 70 book sales that in about an hour and a half, which wow. was really great. And we're going to have a couple more of those coming up. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. We'll have all the information for you. I'll tell you about it on Sharks Radio, but there'll be stuff out on the internet and, and uh, yeah. a lot of other ways too. Excellent. And when we hear about it, we'll share it out through our, through our media sources as well. Yeah. And yeah in fact, there's one yeah. coming up. I think the Toronto game, I'm going to be, uh, we're actually going to be in the concourse of the building. Oh, nice. I don't know how much time I'm going to be there, <laughs> but Ross will certainly be there. And I'm going to make sure I spend some time there too. Good dude. Good. Well, I'm really interested in hearing about your take on the season so far for the Sharks. We're at that point now where it's 15, 20 games, kind of the part where 
you know, the fans are looking at it saying, okay, this is how we're going to look maybe uh, for the rest of the season and whatnot. So I'm kind of just interested in getting your take on where the Sharks are right now and what your outlook is as, as a team as a whole. Well, clearly they're not where they want to be completely, but it's a work in progress every year. And how many times have we seen this with Pete DeBoer's teams? <laughs> mm -hmm. Remember his first year, things didn't really start to click around December 15th or so. Mm -hmm. Finally, everything started to come together. And that's not an indictment of what the coaches do. It's, it's, an it's, it's really just basically a description of how every team each and every year, even with familiar faces, has to get their act together, has to react to the changes in their lineup, has to um, deal with the differences in the way that they're calling the game, yeah. and also the changes in the roster and the competition, and let's not forget that crazy Western Conference schedule that we have yeah. that always seems to get involved early in the season. So um, it, it's, um, it, we're at the stage of the season right now where we basically say this. It's still early, but you better hurry up before it's too late. Yeah. And that's an old phrase that Pete Stemkowski, my former broadcast partner, used to say. And I can't think of a better way to say it, uh, because basically you can't uh, squander your time. Yet these guys have been working really hard at a lot of different factors in the game. I see great progress. I think uh, some individuals have had fantastic starts to the season. We can get into that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I suppose the elephant in the room is, how's Eric Carlson doing? You, you may stay at the top of the show, yeah. we talk about him. I think it's still a work in progress for him. I think he's still adjusting. Remember that he's adjusting not only to a new team, he's adjusting to how to get to the rink every day. Where's the airport? Where do you park? Um, you know, what does my wife do when I'm not when I'm not there? What what kind of activities do we have for her? Where do we, you know, all that's oh, going yeah, on. Yeah. And so, and he's played his whole career in one city. And that happens to be his wife's hometown. So wow. it's a big adjustment for his family well, yeah. and and also on the ice for himself because the Sharks um, play differently and they have a different defense core than the Ottawa Senators had. And so where he might have been used to going out there and, and skating for 30 minutes, they really don't need him to do that because they have Brent Burns, they have Mark Edward Vlasic, Justin Braun, you know, an outstanding group of defensemen. So they need him to refocus and, and, and tailor his game a little bit and he's doing fine. He's going to be fantastic. And I just have a feeling that um, as is the case with most Sharks teams these last few years since Pete DeBoer has been the coach, once uh, you have that seminal moment, that December the 15th, the first year, or um, somebody scores a goal, I, I have a feeling that when he scores his first goal, it's just going to come in buckets. That's a weird thing. And I think that, that it is going to be a sigh of relief. Um, he's already showing us all of the great skill he has. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes me really impressed about him is the way he gets back. After, you know, we, we all know uh, that if you're an offensive defenseman like Sandus Ozelinch or like yeah. Brent Burns, yeah. you like take a little stroll once in a while. <laughs> and uh, that can get a coach a little crazy, but um, both those guys are able to get back. But this guy, I mean, he puts his head down and he really has amazing skating skill to get back. And I think that that's been something that we've seen uh, the team adjust to. So all of that going on in the early season, I'm, I'm, you know, what a year Timo Meyer is having already. Yeah, yeah. And that line combo, too, of Meyer, Couture, and Hurdle really looks like a, an elite group of three guys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's part of the transition that we have been going through here the last couple of years where the team was centered around Thornton and Marlowe. Yeah. Well, Marlowe's now a Maple Leaf. And Joe Thornton is 39 years old and still amazing as he is. He's 39 years old. And you have to be prepared for how the transition eventually takes place. Right. I hope it doesn't happen for another six to eight years, but you just never know, right? <laughs> and so, especially with the injuries that he's had the last couple of years, it's just incredible what he's been able to do. So, uh, to me, uh, we want him to be around and be productive as long as possible, but we also are very excited about the way these guys are developing, and I think that that's been a big story. Uh, another story for me is I think Justin Braun is having a great start yeah. to the year. Mm -hmm. He's been silently, quietly, very consistent. He's usually among the leaders in hits each and every game, which is an interesting thing to keep watching for. He uses his body, but he does it in a way, not like a, a, a big basher, but he's an influencer and he's a great skater and he's a smart hockey player and he's very consistent. Uh, I've liked the way that he's uh, started his mm -hmm. season. And just recently against Calgary, Martin Jones starting to kick into <laughs> gear too. Yes. And that's something that we've been waiting for. So again, uh, this is a long answer, but I really think that things are going in the right direction. I think that Carlson's getting integrated. I think that Burns is off to a great year. As I mentioned, Braun, Meyer, Couture, 
Uh, Pavelski now starting to pick up the points. And it's just nice to see it all start to come together because this is a group that uh, more than anything else really likes each other. Mm -hmm. And it's not always that way with professional teams. We've been lucky here because of the types of people that Doug Wilson's brought in from the coaches to the players. And I think that, uh, I think that that's really exciting for the fans in San Jose to see because there's so many things that are possible with this team. Absolutely. I mean, I think, and one of the things you hit on was the play of Justin Braun, and it's something that we had brought up too. Was I was expecting Braun to have not so much a standout year in terms of points or anything else, but uh, the eyeglass. I think people are going to see how good of a player Justin Braun really is. He's been playing at the, my words, where he's kind of been playing in Vlasic's shadow a little bit, where you have Vlasic is this phenomenal defensive presence. And he kind of takes most of the most of the accolades for that line uh, between Vlasic and Braun. But Braun is is a very capable, very awesome defensive talent that's back there. And I think him maybe being separated from Vlasic earlier in the season, we got to see how good Braun really is being able to play with um, Brendan Dillon. Now the pairings have changed a little bit, and they're back to being with uh, Braun and Vlasic again. But I think it was one of those periods where we got to see Justin Braun being a very good player all on his own. You know, it kind of reminds me of something else, too. When Wayne Gretzky went to Los Angeles all those years ago, I remember that they automatically assumed that he was going to play with Luke Robitaille and <laughs> Dave Taylor because those were the top two wingers on the Kings. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy Carson had played in the middle there. The big trade happened. And then they put them together, and it didn't exactly work the way that they thought, as great of players as all three of those guys were. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think you see that. I mean, you, the assumption that uh, Vlasic's going to play all those minutes with Carlson, uh, but yet maybe he's more comfortable with Braun. And, and you know, those are things that develop over time. I think that, uh, that the other thing that we're seeing that's really interesting, Braun, Ryan, and Dylan, all three mm. have had to deal with curtailed minutes at times yeah. in games and that's going to happen and I think they're all adjusting to it all of them including Vlasic Burns and and Carlson for mm -hmm. that matter um, in Carlson's case he's has having to deal with the fact that there are other guys that are at that elite level that are with him mm -hmm. um, no disrespect to anybody in Ottawa but he was the man there and mm -hmm. there are several men here mm -hmm. and so I think that that's uh, that's just a, a work in progress that's going to be just fine yeah uh, anybody else outside of Timo Meyer, for instance, uh, who is really blossoming right now? We've seen Timo just scoring goals left and right. Yeah, I think that they're in different ways. Different players are are, are doing some good things. Here's an example: Kevin LeBanc. Mm. I think he had that four assist game early in the season, and he's sort of like a stock market chart to me. You know, it, it ratchets <laughs> up a little, and then all of a sudden the, the the market drops a little, and then he's ratcheting back up. Uh, that's that's uh, normal. And I think that uh, he has really worked on his skating. This summer, I, and I don't know if you know her, but Kathy Andrade, who's a, a, a professional skating instructor here, worked with him over the summer a, a lot. Mm -hmm. And she's a real professional. She does a really good job, deserves a lot of credit. Worked with him on his skating stride and on, on some training exercises. Then he went back home and worked over the summer. And I think, I think that he, in the third period, he's got more energy. And he's got a little bit more explosion. He can nice. separate a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and all those are all things that all players have to deal with. The way I like to describe it, when you come to the NHL, it's sort of like, you know, you grow up and you go to high school and you get, uh, you know, you work reasonably hard and you get straight A's and you're the smartest kid in the class. And, uh, you, you know, you, you do all your projects, you get uh, perfect grades. <laughs> and then you take your college boards and you get 1,600 on your SATs and then you go to Harvard. But when you show up at Harvard, everybody got that. Right. Everybody did that. Well, that's what happens with these guys because each player generally is not only the best player on their team growing up, they're probably the best player in the league. Mm -hmm. Then they come here and everybody was that. So that the level is different. What you have, the way you have to prepare for things is different. And I, that's what I see in LeBanc. He's learning that. He's still having his moments like a stock market chart mm -hmm. where something doesn't quite go right or he'll, he'll, he'll go in the wrong direction, but they correct it. And mm -hmm. the best thing is that, that he's working on it. Um, another player that's really exciting to me is Antti Suomela, the center that came yeah. here. He, he led the league in scoring last year in Finland. <laughs> and... He led the league in scoring in spite of the fact that he was getting what we would call Chris Tierney minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, he's playing 15 minutes a game on average, and yet, wow, he's uh, leading the league in scoring. <laughs> what I've noticed about him is that he um, he sort of has an old school attitude to playing the position. He's not afraid to drive right into the hard areas, go right to the front of the net. 
Um, you know, you remember the old bumper sticker, Jesus saves, Esposito scores on rebound. Well, <laughs> well, you know, he, he could likely do that. And the goals that he scored so far have been spectacular. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, you know, at, at this taping, he's got two, both of them amazing goals with his skill. So he's showing smarts, he's showing aggressive play. And he's one of those guys that I think makes the most of the ice time that he gets, which is something you have to be able to do uh, as a young player. Um, Yoki Ryan, another defenseman, young guy, not getting quite as much ice now, mm -hmm. has uh, had his ice time curtailed, especially like third periods in a mm -hmm. few games. Sat out one game recently, came right back. He's doing a lot of, of what, uh, picking up where Paul Martin left off o over the years. Yeah. Learned a lot from him, I think. Just being a stable partner for Brent Burns, uh, making sure that when uh, when Burnsy decides that it's time to, to go, he's there to, to be able to back him up, which is important. Burnsy appreciates that because now he's got that comfort that he can be creative. Right. Um, you know, that's the thing that Carlson's probably looking for in his partner once that all develops. And so, um, realistically, I think that, that, that that's been a nice, you know, it's just been nice to see these young guys start to develop that way, get a little bit better, and uh, and continue the development of the team. I think we talked about this last episode about how the Sharks differentiate themselves with the other top teams in the West, let's say, uh, their depth. Most teams, uh, we were talking about Vancouver. Right. Vancouver's been up at the top of the standings, but if they lose uh, Pedersen. Pedersen or Bosser, right? Is that his name? Besser. 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 Brock Besser. Right? Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, they're finished. I don't think they'd be able to stay afloat, whereas the Sharks could lose Thornton, for a stretch, they could lose a couple players. Knock on wood, let's not do right, that. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but, but they could lose one or two guys, and I think they'd still be okay. Um, well, they lost Hurdle for a couple games. Mm -hmm. um, a recent game against Calgary, Logan Couture didn't play in the third period. We'll see how that affects. You know, this time of the year, that's another thing you asked about, you know, where are we at this time of the year? Yeah. This is the time of the year when the goal scoring starts coming down. You know, we've had a number of high-scoring games and everybody's talking about, well, I guess the game has changed. Well, hold on a second. Yeah, These are the best, last year best player in the way. Yeah. The goals are going to come down. Mm -hmm. It's going to be harder. Uh, the goaltenders are going to get into, uh, into sync. And uh, then the injuries are going to start. And part of that's the fatigue of the travel. Uh, we had a five-game trip earlier in the season back east, which is kind of a traditional one. Mm -hmm. I like it because, for me personally because um, I grew up about an hour and a half from New York and we get to New York in October, I'm telling you guys, that is the best time of the year to be yeah. there. There's no snow, there's no traffic problems, the mm -hmm. weather's beautiful, and we're in Manhattan for five days because there's three teams, yeah. I mean, that's fantastic. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I got a chance to, you know, this particular year on a personal note, get to, you know, walk up to Grand Central Station, go get on the train and um, help my parents celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. Hey, so fantastic. that was uh, that was nice because we had a, a night off. It was a Friday night, and uh, I was able to get away. So, um, but that road trip was grueling. And then mm -hmm. this recent one, the three game trip with three different time zones, mm -hmm. that yeah. was a tough trip. Yeah. That trip to Carolina, Carolina, Nashville, Carolina, and then Anaheim at the end, mm -hmm. that was a tough trip. Yeah. And I think that we saw some, I guess you could say, residual effects of that on the back to back set of games that came the next week in Dallas and in St. Louis, which yeah. they lost both games. Um, no excuses, but sure. but still, um, it's just the reality of what the West Coast teams have to deal with and what all teams go through. And that's where you, you start to get fatigue, you get some injuries, you get guys picking up the flu this time of mm -hmm. year, that happens yeah. too. So um, all of those things are factored throughout the league. And I'll let Aaron uh, ask about Jumbo after this, but I, I'm just curious. Does that affect you guys as much? Sure. As well. So sure. you need because you're doing games and you're traveling. You're, you're having to go through all your research and the amount of time that you're on the air and whatnot. Does that really affect? I mean, how, what I notice on the air that you you're having a hard time with the travel or do you master? Do you, it no, do well? you notice it? No, I don't. No, I, I, don't, I wouldn't <laughs> think so. Number one, I'm doing what I love to do. It's, yeah. it's 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 absolutely awesome to and a privilege to be able to broadcast games in the National Hockey League and to have done it for as long as I've done it. But also to uh, to just get really excited about about being around the best hockey players in the world, seeing all these great cities, and, and the way we travel is just such such a first class way. Mm -hmm. So um, that takes some of the edge off of it. <laughs> but the other part of it is um, the most important thing you can do, more than anything else, is to get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. I swear, um, that solves a lot of your problems. 
drink fluids, have, and I'm talking about of the vitamin C variety. <laughs> um, make sure you make sure you do that. Uh, make sure that you get some exercise. It's hard to do that. That's 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 a challenge I've got to fight through because uh, it's difficult. Sometimes you show up and y you can relate to the players. They wake mm -hmm. up in the morning and they're sore. Yeah. They you know they just went through a hard practice or a hard game and they don't feel like going to practice today, you know? Yeah. It's just human nature. And geez, I'd really like to take the day off, but they can. <laughs> so they show up and that's where Pete DeBoer's been great also about understanding the pulse of his team, deciding when to give him time off, um, when to make it an optional practice. He has a lot of veterans on the team right mm -hmm. now, so he knows they're taking care of themselves. And for them, it's the training they did in the summer. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we do too, is uh, we get out and, uh, and uh, get, exercising in the gym and try to get the, the good night's sleep because um, that's the first thing that goes is, <laughs> is your voice actually but the other thing that happens is is your just your energy level and uh, I've got all these remedies to help when when uh, when mother nature takes over and we've gone through that over the years too but um, but it is it's, it's a grueling schedule but I, I absolutely love every second of it nice uh, going back real quick to Carlson and the travel do you think that's a big adjustment for him coming to mm. a West Coast team in doing so much travel, he won't. He won't on. admit it. I think <laughs> it probably is. At, at least the biggest thing for me is the time zones. Mm -hmm. And I remember this one trip. We still called it the crisscross road trip. It was a few years ago. <laughs> Five games. Time zone change every game. <laughs> what? That's so, so we go back in history and you'll see it. We started in the Pacific time zone in San Jose, mm -hmm. and we flew to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can remember this right. We flew to Winnipeg. So that's Pacific Fine. to Central. Mm -hmm. Then the next game was in, I'm gonna say Calgary, that's Mountain. Mm -hmm. Next game after that was in Vancouver, Pacific. Next game after that was in Edmonton, Mountain. And then the piece de resistance was the last game of the trip. After all that, we flew back to Chicago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that was a tough night. Yeah. That was a tough night for the guys. They had no chance that yeah. one. Are there back to backers during that trip? Uh, if I remember there was one, I think I think it might have been Vancouver Edmonton was back to back. Not that long of a flight, but another time zone yeah, sure. yeah. and all the travel. And it uh, as I remember, it was chilly. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, so let's let's jump to Jumbo mm -hmm. and let's talk about his career and his career in San Jose mainly, since you know Boston kinda didn't really happen in the beginning. <laughs> but well it did happen. Yeah. But 1,500 games, yeah. and if you really think about it, Joe Thornton uh, missed some time there, not because of injury, although he did miss some, but even with the injuries factored in the last two years, there was one season where there was no hockey, mm -hmm. and there were a couple of lockouts where there were half seasons. So he would be right at the top of the NHL in history if all of those seasons were played. Mm -hmm. Patrick Marlowe too, for that matter. and. To think that he has played that many games with the best defenseman always on him, with everybody trying to oh, run yeah. him out of the rink, and yet he's been able to control games. He's actually changed the way he's played over the last few years. A, because of his age, you mm -hmm. know, when your body changes, and it does, I don't care if you're an elite athlete or not, it does change, so you have to change the way you train, the way you uh, eat, the way you sleep, everything. Um, you also have to change your lifestyle when you have children, which he does. Yeah. So he's been married and he has children. That changes your life quite a bit. And uh, you know, then you have to adjust to the changing nature of the game. The fact that he's able to do all those things and be as elite a player as he is, is just remarkable. I think he loves the game more than, uh, than he ever gets credit for outside of the cities he's playing in. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, you know, early in his career, he was seen, I, I guess, as a kind of a happy-go-lucky guy. And he has that attitude about him, but that's just part of his love of the game. But, but uh, beyond that, there's this guy that intensely wants to win a Stanley Cup as much as anybody I've ever seen. Um, he works as hard as anybody. It's why he's been able to come mm -hmm. back from injuries. Probably the best passer I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And he's got a good shot, and he does use it on occasion, <laughs> which is nice. Um, in fact, we were joking about it because when he came back from the first time from his first knee, serious knee injury, um, it took about last season about 10, 15 games from the get going. Mm -hmm. Because remember, that injury happened later, so he didn't have as much time to rehab it going mm -hmm. into, the, into the training camp. But he was on the ice, and the first few games, he had some mobility issues, I thought, last year. Uh, we're not seeing those this time. Right. It's much better. But 
uh, I remember he said, well, I, I can't move the way I normally do. So I just said, I'll shoot the puck. And it started going in. <laughs> hey, Joe, you got a great shot. Uh, he has a great shot. He's a, a wonderful family guy. He's just uh, everything that you'd ever want in a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. And I think we are so lucky to have him here. We've been blessed to have great hockey players here for all these years. And I think he's one of the most special. Oh, it's, it's great. And we talked about this a long time ago in one of our earlier episodes about how a lot of those players, even after they're done and retired, they stick around San mm -hmm. Jose. That didn't they, used to happen. Right. Back in the early yeah. years, it didn't happen. Um, I think what's happened over, over time, A, they're making more money now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as we all know, Bay Area is a challenging place for everybody, yes. mm -hmm. regardless of your income level. But that's not as much of a problem. Um, B... I always like to say that uh, that once their wives and kids start to look at what they've got here, mm -hmm. and, and the fact that it's such a great place to work, that's the other thing too. Doug Wilson's made this a great place to work mm -hmm. through Doug's work um, in the office, but also with the support of uh, amazing owners. I think that we have a great place and a great environment for families and for, for players to work. And uh, that along with the talent that we have here has made this just a, such a desirable place. And it, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, you know, the types of stresses that you have in a place like Toronto, for instance, is very different than what you have here. And so I think that, you know, some players look to have those different things in their lives. Some people never even discover the Bay Area. But as the years have gone by, all these guys have, have wanted to stay and more of them are staying. And I think that uh, our alumni association is getting stronger. It's mm -hmm. great to see. Yeah. It's great to see them around with their kids. You know, Evgeny Nabokov bringing his kid to come yeah. play. Patrick Marley doing the same thing, you know, um, during the time he was here. Um, Owen Nolan with his family. A and all of these people are such a, an important part of our community. To me, that's, that's what you really want in a franchise. And that's what we've got. And it sort of accentuates what's special about San Jose too. Uh, you know, a lot of people didn't know where San Jose was when we first started. <laughs> I remember people used to say, uh, is it near San Diego? Honestly, <laughs> we go to Philadelphia. Where is San Jose? Is it near San Diego? Wow. Uh, now everybody knows where Silicon Valley is. Right, yeah. um, I, you know, you talk about coming out of shadows. You know, San Jose certainly is out of the shadow of San Francisco, which mm -hmm. is the older city. Yeah. But this is a bigger one. And they're very different places. <laughs> so what's really neat is that we have the best of all worlds here. You can... Um, you can see great theater if you want. You can have you can go to the highest level of education here, a place like Stanford or, or Santa Clara or San Jose State, great to ed educational programs. You've got uh, um, amazing weather. If you want to go surfing, you can be there in 45 minutes. If you want to go skiing, you can be there in four hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so what else do you want? That's why uh, it's so expensive to live here. <laughs> well, it's part of it. It certainly is it's part of the reason. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like you had just mentioned, you know, lots of good community um, coming from ex-Sharks players and current Sharks players and whatnot. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about was there is a Pavelski program, some program that Joe Pavelski is putting together. I think you have more of the details on that. I'll go ahead and yeah, let you Yeah, I talk do. About and it. in fact, you can go to company39.com, company spelled with a K. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I, and I think uh, that's a good place to go to see it. Joe Pavelski put together a, what he's calling a digital memoir. Mm. And what it is is a journey back into his life. And uh, a camera crew went to where he grew up and where he played in Plover, Wisconsin, and just outside there. And they talked to all of his old coaches. Um, they went to the rinks where he played, and they, mm -hmm. they wanted to show people um, the humble beginnings that he had mm -hmm. and the fact that he was able to uh, achieve great heights by uh, having a great dedication to the game. Again, the five things that Doug Wilson always talks about. Have you heard of those? The five mm -hmm. things that Doug Wilson has always said makes a great shark. Okay. Um, and or a great hockey player for that matter. Um, one, you have to have character. Two, you have to have hockey sense. That is, you have to be a student of the game. Three, you have to love the game. Joe Thornton, prime example. Um, my uncle, I give this example, hockey through a season is a very grueling, grueling experience. It's very tough. And as I said, some days you get up and you don't wanna, you just don't feel good. And you have to get through that. Mm. I have an uncle who was, uh, who's buried at Arlington National Cemetery, and he's the only person I personally knew, but there were many who did this, who uh, saw action serving our country in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. He was in oh, all three. Wow. He, um, he, was, he earned the Silver Star from the U.S. military, which is 
um, very close, not the Medal of Honor, but, but the next level. Mm -hmm. And he retired a full colonel in the Army. And he always used to tell us that when he was out there, um, the love of his family and the love of his country what, what got him through the most difficult situations. Now, not to compare um, hockey to war, although some people inappropriately, I think, <laughs> mm. do. But there's a, you know, I, you can understand what people are coming from, especially those who have never served. But um, when you're going through that, that tough time, the love of the game, that third quality, oftentimes gets you through. Mm -hmm. And it also uh, creates an environment that's much better. There are people who are great NHL players that don't love the game. <laughs> it's just that there's, it's something it's that they're good thing. at. Yeah. It's a job. And uh, so Doug has always said that he would rather have people who love the game, and that's what we've cultivated here. Yeah. Uh, the fourth and fifth items are the, probably more important than all of those in some respects. The fourth one is make other people around you better. Mm. Joe Thornton is the best example of that. Mm -hmm. Logan Couture does it. Um, you know, people like Eric Carlson and Brent Burns and players like that do it. So Joe Pavelski. And the fifth one is the one we always uh, like to struggle through, and that's the one that you work on each and every year, and that is be at your best when it matters the most. What does it matter the most? It's the playoffs. Right. It's when the game has to be won. It's when you show up. Um, you know, I think of great moments in Sharks history, and well, I, I can't remember if I talked about this in the book. I think I did. Um, but uh, when Jeremy Roenick didn't play in Game 6 against Calgary, came back and had two goals and two assists, four points, that was kind of his final, mm -hmm. shall we say, signature moment of his career. But yet he was able to gather up enough to get through that and to do it under those circumstances. And we have lots of examples of that, of players that, that, that have, you know, Martin Jones in Game 5 against Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. What a, an amazing goaltending performance in the final. Um, Jonas Donskoy having what they call the Sisu to come out, and that's a Finnish word for what we're talking about. The ability to gather that little extra energy, and that's the phrase that they use. I talked to him about it, and he said it's very appropriate. But to, to get out and score that overtime goal against Pittsburgh in the final. Those are the things that get you through, and those are the things that make you great great athletes and great, great players, but it all, they also make you great people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that this team is, uh, because it's been through that, not as a group together, this group, but many of them have been through that, and most of them as sharks. They now know what it takes to win the Stanley Cup, whereas before, they only had an inkling of an idea. They weren't really sure. They thought they knew, mm -hmm. but they didn't really know. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a big difference when you're competing for the Cup. Okay, and, and so for Pavelski's program that he's doing, it's uh, Company 39, Company with a K. Is right, that right, K. So, Okay, just so we, because we want to put the link in the description down below. So. But I, I want to emphasize yeah. this is much more than just simply an overview of his life and his career. I mean, that's part of it to, to tell a young kid that it doesn't matter where you're from, you can do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's part of the message. But the other part of the message is to take the things that he's learned and to go over some skating drills and go over some other drills that you that anybody can use even if they don't have the equipment. Things you can do if you can't afford ice time or if you live in a place that doesn't have a lot of ice in the summer. Um, these are things that he's developed over the years and it's a really good program. Nice. And in fact, I can tell people if you go to company39.com and uh, use the promo code, and I better get it right, I think, <laughs> I think it's just simply Dan um, you can get a discount on the program too, so that's Perfect. that's another nice thing. We'll, we'll get the promo code. You can tell us uh, after we're, we're filming here, and we'll make sure that it pops up the yeah. correct way if it's not Dan. So yeah, okay. we'll I, I got to look it up to be make sure, sure that uh, everybody watching gets the right promo. I code. should know that by heart, but <laughs> what the heck? Yeah. I was part of that. I, I actually hosted that. Uh, that uh, we did a couple of segments with him, and uh, they had a really top quality film crew come in. Nice. They did a fantastic job. Um, and I think it's really worth it. If, you, if you're interested in the sport, yeah. if you play the sport, mm -hmm. it's really designed for people who are, um, have high aspirations to, for the game, but it also is a reminder to people, um, love the game, yeah. enjoy it. Don't make it uh, you know, NHL or bust in your mind. Enjoy the game and do the best you can. Mm -hmm. Get an education and all those other things that are important. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, cool. love it. So. Uh, Again, Dan is my, my source for how to say a last name correctly. <laughs> so uh, in the spirit of that, we're going to do a little name game oh here. Oh, boy. So <laughs> um, these are all, now these are all 
ex Sharks players or guys from the AHL. Current squad? or ex. Current or ex. Or AHL. Or AHL players from the Sharks, Sharks organization. organization. Yes. Okay. So uh, what what's going to happen is we're going to put it up on the screen so you guys can see it, and then Aaron's going to read the name. Is this going to be like bad lip reading? Uh, probably. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll put it up on the screen. Um, Aaron will go ahead and and read it. I'm going to read it the we way. We know this one. It's I Rourke Chartier. Yeah. So I'm going to say the other way because it might be wrong. Rourke Chartier, but. Obviously, you we know. say Rourke Chartier. Chartier, Chartier yeah. Right. Okay. I was think think Brian Trottier. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah. From Saskatchewan, French background, not that different. Western right. Canadian. Here you go. Okay. So Chartier, not Chartier. Right. Chartier. Okay. That's the first one. <laughs> we keep saying this one too, and I keep <laughs> butchering it. Alexander Chemlevsky. That's As an interesting one. I'm gonna say Alexander Shemlevsky because I think I heard it the right way. But okay, there's a story behind this. <laughs> okay, <one. laughs> the real pronunciation of his name is not the way he says it. Okay, and we have a player on the Sharks roster like that too. So Sasha, which is the um, Russian diminutive nickname for Alexander. Right. So if your name is Alexander, they call you Sasha. <laughs> in uh, in the Russian language. His family came from over there, but he's a Californian, right? right? Um, everybody says Shemilevsky, but the real pronunciation of his name is Khmilevsky. Whoa. <laughs> and it's because of the transliteration of the Cyrillic alphabet to English. This happens all the time. Okay. It usually happens, another great one, we call him one of the greatest players ever, Sergei Fedorov. Mm -hmm. Right? What's yeah. it supposed to be? It's, it's really Fyodorov. Fyodorov. Oh, wow. F Y O, not F E D. Okay. And the reason why that happened is because the Russian language curiously has two letters, actually three total, but two that look like our letter E. Okay. One of them is exactly like our letter E, and the other one is the letter E with an umlaut over it, the okay. two dots. Yeah. Except. So the, the letter with the E, just with no umlaut, is pronounced yeah. Not e, eh, but yeah. Okay. And the one with the umlaut is pronounced yo. And that's Fyodorov. Okay. With its, he is as the umlaut. But here's the curiosity. If you re-pick up a Russian newspaper, they never put the umlaut in. They just put it, <laughs> and you, you're supposed to know. Yeah. So they never actually put, put it into their language. Oh, wow. Except Did in like basic guides okay. you pick up a newspaper it's never there did it drives he ever me correct crazy. anybody on oh, no he no he no he's he didn't care. by that it's over yeah. the other one like that is kevin lebanc mm. what's that supposed to be well a lot of people think he's french lebanc a lot of people think <laughs> he's french <laughs> he's not uh -huh. his family's from slovakia oh, oh wow and they say labans wow but that's how his father milan says it however if you look at his twitter handle it's straight to the bank it's it's over. Yeah. And when he went to junior hockey, you know, wherever he was growing up, it was anglicized. It's Americanized. Right. So, I mean, it happens with, with guys. So we're saying Shimilevsky. Okay. Shimilevsky. Straight to the Bonds. La Bonds. Straight to La Bonds. Yeah. That's what that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Carlos Cuxty? Ah. Carlos. I have trouble with this one. So, Cooks, what, Cooksty. Okay. Um, he, this is how I understand it's pronounced. Okay. So he's playing at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, where, right, not far from where I grew up. They have a Division One hockey program now. I believe it's pronounced Carly Suxta. Wow. Okay. Where is he from? I, I didn't look at where he's from. He's from, he's from um, <laughs> Latvia or Lithuania. He's from, okay. he's from that area. I think okay. it's Latvia. Man. So it'll be interesting. I'm going to have to talk to him. And this is how we do it. I walk up to the player... And I say, how do you pronounce your name? That gets back to the Tom Barrasso story right. where he doesn't care. And a lot of them don't. A lot of them, here's what happens. They just want to get along. They yeah. don't want to make waves or say, my name is pronounced this yeah. way because they're seen as, not, as being problematic. I don't know why they do that. <laughs> and then what happens is, is the, the guys who are making the decisions on their career are mispronouncing their name. So, you know, here's another one. A guy that played at Cornell his name, everybody, all the hockey people pronounced his name Mosier. His name was Mazer, but <laughs> he didn't bother to correct people. <laughs> and, you know, that happens more than you, you would ever believe. Yeah. Well, I mean, with these names. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, as I understand it, I have to ask him again, but I think it's Suxta. Suxta. 
I believe that's the technical yeah, way to really say it. Um, no. Yeah, <laughs> it may, might be Sook. I think it's yeah, it's Sook 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 Yeah, I think that's right. All right, Jaden Hobblegawatts. <laughs> that's a great one. Jaden Hobblegawaks. Hobblegawaks. So it it's a good one. He <laughs> plays for the Barracuda. It's yes. Halbgavats. Hal oh, with a V like sound. Halbgavats. Hal yeah, Hal 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 it, 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 it's Hal it's a slightly altered pronunciation of the German, which would be closer to what you're saying. Halbgavachs oh. is probably. You got to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what the. You got to get the hairball out. When right. You're, okay. But yeah. he's Canadian. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Ivan Chekovic. Uh, Chekovic. I'm going to go with Ivan, first of all, and then Chekovic. I'm having trouble with this one okay. because, Ooh. well, because I believe, the, this is the way I've been saying it. I've been saying Ivan Chekovic. Oh, okay. Um, there are some people that say Chekovic because they, they're anglicizing it. Mm -hmm. and, and we have one in the NHL now, Ivan Provorov. Mm -hmm. His name is really Ivan Provorov, right? Ivan. Mm -hmm. But he says, just call me Ivan. He's anglicized it. So this guy is another a guy like that. He's having a heck of a year in the Quebec oh, League. Yeah. And you know what? He really was impressive in preseason. Mm -hmm. um, both Chekhovich and Shimoljevsky, you better get used to pronouncing their names yeah. because they were 18 years old. They came to Roy Sommer's team at the end of last year. Yeah. And they were main reasons why they, they won six in a row and made the playoffs. Mm -hmm. I think these guys have a future. I, yeah. I really am excited about that. might see both of them next year. Yeah, I think possibly. so. Yeah, and, and I'm actually pretty excited. And to hear this your, year, too. Oh, yeah. I'm excited to hear you actually say that because it was something that we had talked about on the show was mm -hmm. look at these guys. It was sixth and seventh round picks. Yep. And they came right into the Barracuda and essentially uh, kickstarted them into the playoffs. There. Now, that may not translate in the long run to a full-time NHL career. We don't know because sure. they're developing. But the fact that they could do that as teenagers, the big test now will be uh, the way the rules work, because they're both junior hockey players, mm -hmm. they can't come to the AHL before they're 20 until their team right. season is over. So that's why they came at the end of last year, because their junior teams ended, mm -hmm. and they ended up coming here and playing really well. Well, they can do that again this year, but uh, next season now, they'll be 20, and they'll be eligible to play a full season. But now you get the adjustment of you've had some success, and now you're playing a full season against men, and you're mm -hmm. playing, you know, they don't do three games and three nights in the Western Conference, or at least in the Pacific, of the AHL like I used to do when I was in the American <laughs> League. But uh, but they they play an intense schedule, and it's fast, and, these, and everybody's trying to make their way up, so mm -hmm. they give everything they've got. And there's usually a bit of an adjustment period, even for good players. Nice. I'm excited to see them. Long. Yaroslav Otterville. Ah, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, okay, Yaroslav Otevrel. So when he first came here, and, and he, this is an interesting story. I haven't uh, kept track of how he's doing. There's a story behind it. Mm -hmm. um, when he came, everybody thought it was Otevrel. He okay. came and he said, no, my name is Otevrel. With the, pronun with yeah. the, stress, okay. the stress on the first syllable. Mm -hmm. And you see that happen in a lot of these Eastern European... Uh, countries. The sad part about his career is he played a little for this Sharks team. He played in the uh, IHL in Kansas City too and he played in the NHL but he ended up going back to Europe and I don't exactly remember how it happened. I think it was in a game but he was paralyzed. Oh, oh wow. And I don't know whether or not that was something that w was mitigated or whether it was something that w he was going to permanently be that way. Yeah. We knew that he would not be um, ever 100% again. Mm -hmm. But many times when you have situations like that, I, I know another player, Peter McGeo, a friend of mine, he was a defenseman at St. Lawrence University. He was a great player, great human being. His uh, maybe third professional hockey game in the AHL, he broke his back oh. and was paralyzed, but he, he's walking again. Oh, that's good. And he's very successful in the uh, financial industry. And I always, when, when the Thrashers were in Atlanta, I used to always run into him. Uh, Jamie Baker, also very close friends with him because he went to St. Lawrence as I did. And we would always get together with him, but uh, hes uh, we haven't seen him in a couple of years since they moved back to Winnipeg. But I really uh, i really know that you can, there are certain injuries. James Hinchcliffe, who's uh, um, you know an IndyCar, went through some of that. 
and uh, also uh, Robert Wickens this season, he's partially paralyzed. He's oh, wow. technically a quadriplegic from, from a big accident that he had in IndyCar, but um, there's hope that, that he may be able to recover to a point where not only he'll be able to walk again, he might, uh, he'd probably be able to race again. Wow. So wow. This, this happens across sports. And, right. And uh, and I've seen that happen. You know, and in the case of Hinchcliffe, he's a Canadian driver. He got a, a piece of drive shaft or something went through his leg, oh. and he he was very serious, uh, yeah. uh, life threatening condition. But because of the great doctors, you know, we have in sports, they have it in in IndyCar and in Formula One, and they have it in in the NHL. Yeah. Um, they're able to get to these guys really quickly. You know, another example of that was in Buffalo one time when Clint Malarchuk had oh, yeah. got his skate, yeah. cut him in the neck, hit mm -hmm. his jugular vein, or maybe it was his aorta, I, I think it was his jugular vein, and uh, blood all over the place. All but over, in yeah. the old, that happened in the odd, in Buffalo, the old building, mm -hmm. and the way the odd was, was one end of the building, the, the, all the dressing rooms were in the end zone, and that side of the rink, there were two doors to open to get out. The other side of the rink, there were, there were no doors. So the only way you get there was to run across the ice. It just so happened, as I remember, that he was injured on the side with the doors, yeah. and the doctor was right there. Yeah. If he would have had to have run across the ice, who knows? He Done. might not have, yeah. might not have, might not have made yeah. it. And uh, so these are little stories that we see around the league, and that's what I think of when I see Yaroslav Otavrel. That's wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, going on to the next one, Ilya Biakin. <laughs> These boots were made for Biakin. <laughs> that's what, well, that's, I guess it's Ilya Biakin. Yeah, it's, it's Ilya Biakin. Okay. Ilya, Ilya Biakin. Yeah, he he was an interesting character. Now, <laughs> we had we had Slava Butsayev, whose nickname was Boots, and then we had Ilya Biakin. So we said, hey, these boots, boots. are made for Biakin. <laughs> that's right. the old Nancy Sinatra song. Yeah. Uh, Vyacheslav Butsayev. Right. Vyacheslav Butsayev. Okay, so. Vyacheslav is correct. Okay. It's Butsayev. Butsayev. Butsayev, accent on the second to last syllable. Most of the time in the Russian language, Rusinowski, right? Uh -huh. Second to last syllable. Um, except for huh. the that famous letter Y. Oh, okay. okay. The, it's, oh, the stress is always on that one. And huh. there are a couple that are on the first syllable, but mo for the most part. And Vyacheslav is, is his full name, but he went by the nickname Slava. 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 Mm, yeah. So Slava Fetisov, his, yeah. his first name yeah. is Vyacheslav. Slava Kozlov. No, yeah. there you go. Right. Uh, Petr, uh, Petri Shriko. Skriko. That was an H. <laughs> yeah, uh, Petri... Yeah, Skriko. Yep. Skriko. Petri Skriko. He was a 30-goal scorer for... Um, did, you for say, did you say Skriko? Skriko. Skriko. No, okay. Skriko. I said okay. Skriko, sorry. <laughs> um, who knows? Maybe I flood. But <laughs> no. But he um, he was the thirty goal scorer for Vancouver. He was with the Sharks the first year, mm -hmm. and that was the end for him. Um, really good guy, uh, good player too. Over yeah, over nice. the years that he played, I, I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed him. Well, that was fun. Um, <laughs> well, I, I again uh, the master of names. If yes. ever you need a name pronounced correctly, I'm sure uh, Dan would be happy to help you out with that one. <laughs> and we're so. happy to flub it for you too. I mean, <laughs> right. the, the main thing that we try to do, all of us, Randy Hahn and I both do it. You walk up to the player and you ask him how he wants to say his name, how you, he wants us to pronounce his name. And sometimes it takes a little bit. You have to, you know, you have to practice it. Number one, and uh, yeah, I've got a great story for you. There was a, an NHL player at one time. He played mostly in the American League, but he also played in the NHL. And I remember him in Buffalo and in Los Angeles. And his name was Bob Halkitis, a defenseman. Hmm. And he would go up to the PA announcer in New Haven and he would say, I'm changing the pronunciation of my name. I want you to call me Halkitis. <laughs> so then that would last about two games. Then he'd go, no, no, you're getting it wrong. It's Halkitis. <laughs> then at three or four games later, it was, no, 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 it's Halkitis. <laughs> and he, so far, he was just Greek. doing it to, to get the PA announcer mad. Yeah. And uh, so that's that's a good story for you. Oh, that's I guess great. that's great. I was going to ask for a story time, but I just yeah. got one, so yeah. I think we're good to go yeah, right that, there. That, that's one. Yeah. Oh, you got another one you want to uh, share? Well, there's, there's many stories like that, uh, not just with pronunciation of okay. names. I got the Barrasso one, yeah. of course. But... Uh, um, you know, there, there are all sorts of things, and in fact, there are some in the book that mm -hmm. we talk about that uh, I think are funny ones. Uh, one of the better ones was uh, uh, Ally Afraidy um, sitting with me in the booth one time because he was hurt again, <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, he used to he used to like to smoke a cigarette every <laughs> more than every once in a while. He's one of the old school guys who'd still smoke. Yeah, yeah. Um, didn't recommend it to anybody else, but he would have a cigarette when he was playing. And uh, he would light the, light the cigarette with the blowtorches they used to fix the sticks. <laughs> well, one time he was deciding to have a cigarette, and he was in Dallas at Reunion Arena. And uh, he was standing outside the locker room. And in, in that arena, remember, all of these old arenas weren't designed for hockey. So mm -hmm. everything is much more controlled now. But that building, the, it was in a hallway where all the skate stuff was. And it was in a hallway where um, you could see out to where the fans were walking into the building. So they were walking right by this open door. And Al is standing there, having a cigarette, totally naked. <laughs> so um, this security guard, you know, typical blue coat, you know, right. stereotype, comes rushing up to him and says, sir! And he looks at her and he had that stone-faced look. Yeah, yeah, what's the story? And she said, there's no smoking in the arena. <laughs> like, smoking was bad, but naked was okay. In front of all the fans. <laughs> Yeah, go figure. Oh my goodness. She at least knew he was a player, I'm, I'm hoping. Oh, oh yeah, okay. no, no, she knew. Okay, just... Yeah, you, you couldn't miss Al. Oh, Al was goodness. one of my favorites. That's great. Yeah, another, took... but another time he was with me in the booth when he was hurt again, and uh, he was doing color commentary, and he would sometimes go into a story, like he'd start talking about his son while the play was going on, goal would <laughs> score, it didn't matter. And another time he, uh, he was watching the guys play, and everything went, went went wrong on this shift, and it was in Vancouver in the uh, in the current building, Rogers Arena. And the booth there is really nice; it's kind of a gondola, so you're a little separated. But there's definitely, again, no smoking anywhere. Mm -hmm. So Al's having a cigarette there <laughs> in, inside the press box, and uh, I think five players made a mistake. That, you know, I I don't remember exactly who did it. It might have been Alexander Mogilny or somebody went through the whole team, scored mm -hmm. a goal. And Al could be heard on the radio taking a drag from his cigarette, <laughs> blowing it out and going, <laughs> then he says, I'm baffled, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have thought of any way. Best color commentator ever. Oh, my God. No. Oh. I remember Al. Did he ride a motorcycle, too? Sure. Was he was a Harley guy that rode yeah. up with... Yeah, well, yeah. He, he was kind of an earlier version of Brent Burns in many ways. He, huh. he kept getting hurt, but he, he was big. He was really strong. He had a fearsome shot over 105 yeah, miles an hour. Yeah, he, yeah. He, would, he had the old record before Chera had yeah. it. And he had all kinds of tattoos, just like Bernsey does. In fact, I remember he was going over them with somebody that was writing a story about it back in the early 90s. And he pointed out one and he said, this is a crazy horse and it's to remind us that we're all on, on Indian land. This one have a reminder. He was really serious wow, about it. Cool. Um, there were a couple of other ones that he had. So he didn't have the snakes that Burns he had, but he had the tattoos. And then the other thing is he was he was very sensitive about his hair because he was losing his hair. <laughs> oh, okay. And he had long hair in the back and he would comb it over and he was very sensitive about it. Um, back when he played in Toronto, in fact, he wouldn't ever they wouldn't ever put him in the starting lineup because he would have to take his helmet off. <laughs> so he would he would take his helmet off but stand in the in the sort of the alleyway or in the tunnel so you couldn't see him but th that, that at least that's how the story goes but he was just sensitive about it but then he decided the heck with this yeah. and he shaved his head and now he's perfectly fine nice it's a great hairstyle <laughs> <laughs> see yeah. uh, for those listening as a podcast yes Aaron is bald so um, well Dan uh, thank you so much for stopping by uh, we have uh, something that we wanted to get uh, give him I believe do yes. we have it with us right now if not, we'll we'll have our pr super producer Jason go and run and grab it. There we go. So we we got a, a bottle of oh the uh, Vin Factor. Yeah, the, yes, the, <laughs> the Vin Factor, yeah, the Vin Factor uh, on on a bottle of wine there Isn't for you. Isn't that nice? Yeah. So uh, we just wanted to thank you for coming on to the show again. Uh, the book, if these walls could talk, sounds the sharks version, obviously, uh, with uh, Dan and Ross. And it's a great book with lots of good stories, like uh, many of the ones you just heard right now, yeah, like yeah, those. And, and you know, my favorite chapter is the last chapter. It's, mm -hmm. It really is my favorite one. It's uh, a chapter that uh, probably will never happen again in Sharks history, but uh, back in the old days, we used to um, have a lot more opportunities like this where you, a fan for charity would bid on a trip yeah. with the team on the plane. That doesn't happen quite as much anymore. But this one time, a guy, gentleman came on, and he says, you know, I have a... I have a strange connection to the game of hockey. And I said, well, what is it? He said, well, my father, my birth father was an NHL player. I was adopted and I, I have a whole different family. And uh, I just have been doing some research on it and wanted to find out more about it. And 
Uh, one thing led to another. We actually got him to meet his birth father maybe within a year before he died. Wow. So we got a chance to meet his birth father. In the ensuing years, we've gotten him in touch with his birth mother's family. He never met his birth mother, but um, it's a very heartwarming story and one of my favorites, and I think people will enjoy that too. Awesome. And that was uh, kind of pre-internet days. It wasn't as easy to search for no. family members as it is now. No. So you well, did a lot of legwork there. But, yeah, but even so, you st I still had to do the legwork, mm -hmm. and the other part of it was I just had this sinking feeling in my mind um, there was part of this, the, the mystery was people thought he was dead. Mm. And he's also one of the most notorious players in the history of hockey, which mm. we'll get to in another time. <laughs> so that's, that's the, it's, it's, got a, it's got a lot of potential for nice. that story beyond a chapter in my book, but mm. I hope people enjoy it. Yeah, it's yeah. a great read. Well, we'll be looking for a sequel then, if that's the case. <laughs> so watch out for that one. Well, as Jonathan Chichu used to say, oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I forgot. There's one more name that we have to have you try to pronounce. It's uh, one of the guys in the Sharks organization, Mr. Jonathan Beecher. 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 Be Beecher. No, Becker. <laughs> Becker. <laughs> kind of. A it's a running joke on the show. That's awesome. <laughs> John, if you're watching, love you too, bud. Okay, so um, I think that does it for episode 22. That's We're it. Good? Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed uh, all of what Dan had to say here. Uh, Dan, once again, thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate you coming you out. Thank you. Um, you are absolutely welcome back anytime you'd like. <laughs> so Great set. Love the show. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that does it for episode so number 22, and we will see you guys next week. Next week. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out the show. You can support us by following us at The Fin Factor on Twitter and Facebook. You can also find us on Instagram as at Fin Factor. If you're listening to us as a podcast, please, please, please give us a five-star review. And if you want to support our show, share our episode with your friends. Please leave us a comment of what you thought of this episode. And if you want us to cover anything else, let us know.